RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Liquid Sun Race, and of course, our new sponsors, Ariel Cuts Training and Fitness. I'm your host, Steve Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions. Of course, this past weekend was the 2019 Arnold Classic South America, more commonly referred to as the Arnold Brazil One. Of course, by Juan Morels. We now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, right now at RxMuscle.com and the YouTube channel, your one-on-one -on -one interview with Juan Morel. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, Juan and I, obviously, I've been helping Juan. I was helping Juan from when he first started bodybuilding up until, you know, he won a uh, pro show or two as a pro. And now, he, you know, he coaches people. Now he does his own diet. But, you know, Juan and I couldn't interview. And I used to have Juan on the TV show like every week, practically, when we were in New York. Because he'd always come down and he'd pop in the studio. And, you know, so we did training videos with him. And then he, you know, he signed with, um, with a supplement company. Apollo and Gym Supplements, and they, they had some kind of relationship with uh, Flex Magazine, so he had been exclusive. So, you know, I really wanted to interview him after he won, because just because, you know, to, to give him his props and everything like that, and get, get an update for our audience. And he asked permission, and they obviously gave him uh, permission, so we got to do the interview. So it was great, you know, talking with Juan, catching up on camera, even though we talk, you know, off camera. And, uh, you know, it was a big win for him. Uh, winning an Arnold Classic is, you know, not everyone will win an Olympia at some point in their career. That, that's a very rare thing. But if you can win an Arnold Classic, that's about as close as you can get to, to perfection. So having said that he won an Arnold Classic is definitely a feather in Juan's cap, and it definitely raises his stock up a lot. You know, how he's going to do with the Olympia, who knows? But, you know, it was great to see him, you know, be interviewed by Arnold and stand up there and have his hand raised up in the air. And uh, I know he was, it was definitely a highlight of his career. So, of course, that interview live with Juan Morel right now at RxMuscle.com and the Rx Muscle YouTube channel. Let's go to the questions. The first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, for someone on self-administered HRT at 40 years old, would a small amount of DECA be beneficial? If so, what would be the dosing um, and test when combined would you suggest? You know, a lot of people do 200 milligrams of testosterone a week as HRT. You know, if you like DECA and maybe you want the joint, you know, uh, anti-inflammation effects that you get from the DECA, you can do 100 DECA, 100 tests, you know, uh, per week. And that, that should work pretty well, and it should also keep your levels in the normal range. You're not going to be in, in those, you know, pharmacological range. But, I, you know, I, when I, was, I did it for a little while, like many years ago, when I first tore my quad to help with the recovery. And... I'm seriously, I felt like I was on a cycle because I hadn't taken stuff in, in years. You know, I had been on HRT for just years. And it really, it boosted me. So you don't really need a lot of DECA to get the anti-inflammation effect. You need more DECA to get the, 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 the big pharmacological muscle building effect. But I got a nice boost from it. So that would probably be what I recommend. If you want to be more conservative, you go with 50 milligrams of DECA and 50 milligrams of testosterone per week. But I would say it's in that range. Second question, again, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, I'm following your diet. It's your cyclical one exactly like you've laid out in the app. I'm gaining muscle, losing fat. Thanks for all the information you provide us. I've read the fats in peanut butter are not the best. Are there better options? Why did you choose peanut butter as a fat source? Um, yeah, first of all, I want to just say uh, the Dave Palumbo Experience app, which is available for iTunes uh, and Android you know, phone users, it's $29 a month. It's a subscription Basically, you get access to all the articles and, and videos that I've done over the years. It's, uh, it's a great resource. I also answer everyone's questions that they have. So you post your questions, I answer them, but I put it, answer it in an open forum so everyone sees the answers to everyone's questions, which is a great learning tool because not everyone can think of the questions that they really need, but then they read someone else's and they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. And then I also do an exclusive Q&A video every week for the app members as well. Uh, likewise, we've been just starting to add weekly workouts. So if you want a new workout every week, we put that up as well. And it, it's, a, it's a bevy of information. And, you know, we've been seeing a, a tremendous rise in members recently because the questions have been getting better and better and more and more. So uh, keep them coming. And if, you know, tell your friends about it. It's something great if you can't afford coaching. Or even I have a lot of guys who are coaching, doing coaching with me, and they are app members. So it's, it's a great resource either way. Um, as far as um, this question goes... Um, they wanted to know, I confused myself, what was the question again? Peanut butter, are there oh, better butter, fat right, right, sources right, okay. for peanut butter, which you've laid out in your right, diets? Right. So, 
I like to vary the fat sources. So I don't just give peanut butter every meal. I've had people say to me, hey, can I just eat peanut butter or nuts every single meal as my fat source? And I say, you could, but you wanna vary the fat sources just like you wanna vary the protein sources. I don't like people eating chicken for every single meal. Although I have people who do it, you know, because that's all they like. But uh, peanut butter is one source of fat. I use macadamia nut oil, which is a monounsaturated fat. I use fish oil. I use uh, whole eggs, omega-3 whole eggs. Uh, I have uh, avocados, you know, so extra virgin olive oil. I try to vary the fat sources so that you're getting all the right ones you need. You're getting a little saturated fat, you're getting a little, you're getting some mostly monounsaturated fat, which is where you want most of it coming from. And then of course your essential fats, which are omega-3s and 6s. Um, you know, fish oil and, and stuff like that would fit into the omega-3 category. So I don't only use a peanut butter. The reason I use peanut butter in the shakes is because they taste good. People like the, the, the combination of the whey isolate with a tablespoon or a tablespoon and a half, depending on how you know, big the person is, of all natural peanut butter. Obviously, we're not using peanut butter with sugar in it. We're using just natural peanut butter that's just peanuts and salt. A lot of people don't want to use peanut butter or they're allergic. They use almond butter or they use you know, cashew butter. There's, there's a million different things. I give a, a general blanket statement because people want me to, you know, they like that I give out stuff for free, but I can't give 14 different combinations for free. So I give you, the, the, you know, the, my, my blanket statement that I kind of, that I always followed. And then, you know, you can modify it according to yourself. Or if you hire me or someone else with coaching, they could, they could you know, customize it more so. But if you don't like peanut butter or you don't want to use peanut butter, don't use it. You, I got people who put a tablespoon of macadamia oil into their shakes. And, and they're fine with it. You know, most people like the substance of the, of the peanut butter or the nut butters in there. Once again, you got to measure it. You can't go crazy and put the whole jar in there, which I know a lot of people do too. And then they wonder why they don't lose weight. There's a lot of calories in that. So once again, it's, it's not that I, I, I favor one over the other. It's like I like to vary the sources. Let's go to our Instagram questions. If you're not following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. Let's go to bar LXRD. Tips on correcting muscle imbalances. Well, I'm assuming you mean um, visual imbalances. In other words, one arm is bigger than the other, or one leg is bigger than the other. And let me let me tell you guys, you'll never have perfect symmetry. No one else may be able to tell. You'll always know which side is stronger, which side is bigger. It's funny because my weaker side was always my bigger side because when I because when you have a sm an area that's small, let's say one leg is smaller than the other. You wind up training that leg a little more, it winds up getting stronger than the other leg. It's just, it's a weird uh, conundrum. If you look at your face, okay, in the mirror, you'll see asymmetries to your face. That's why if you ever hear, they always say, what's your better side? For me, I don't have a good side at all. They're both terrible, but my left side is my better side. So th th that's just the way it goes. But for bodybuilding purposes, I, what I would always do is if I had a very glaring um, imbalance from one side to the other, I would do start doing unilateral movements. So let's say I have one bicep that's bigger than the other. I wouldn't do barbell curls anymore. I would just do single arm, you know, individual curls so that I can make sure that both biceps are working exactly the same. I would, of course, use the same weights. Um, also, a lot of times at the end of a workout, okay, I would do a couple extra sets, maybe one or two extra sets for the weaker arm or the weaker leg or the weaker delt or whatever it happens to be to give it a little more work. And also, if I did, was, if I was using bilateral movements, like let's say I'm, one leg is bigger than the other, but I'm squatting. Now, there's no way to replace squats with unilateral movements because you can't do enough weight. I would always push from the weaker side. So my, le my left side was always my bigger leg and my right side was always a little smaller. So I would always, when I would squat, I, I wouldn't even think about the left leg. I would only focus on the right leg. It was like the left leg wasn't there. And the reason I didn't have to focus on it, it was because it was my dominant leg anyway, in terms of size. And when I did that and I focused only on the right leg, pushing, you know, mind muscle connection, it grew, it, it, it caught up. You know, it was still always a little smaller, but it was negligible to the eye. And, and that's the key, it's all an illusion. We have a ton of questions, we'll see how many we can get through. Alexander Yeramazov, Lighter weight, but stronger contractions, or heavier weight with proper form, but less focused on the squeeze. Well, you know, I think a lot of people, when, when they hear focus on the squeeze, it doesn't mean you're hitting, if you're doing bicep curls, it doesn't mean you're doing a double bicep pose when you're, when you're, when you're doing the movement. It just means when, you, when you're curling the weight up, make sure you feel the contraction. And when you come down with the weight, control it so that you're getting a good negative or eccentric portion of the movement. 
Uh, I think a lot of people, they, they start doing you know, this, and they let the momentum and, and gravity carry them down, and they're really not working the muscle. So light weights okay, are great for reteaching you form. After an injury, after a surgery, maybe if your form just sucks and you're not growing and you want to go back to lighter weights, but you're not really going to grow from that. Um, now, I obviously haven't trained you know, for quite a long time my upper body because I had my, my shoulder replaced and then I had the, shoulder, you know, the other shoulder replaced the year before. So now that I'm coming back, I'm doing lighter weights and squeezing, but I'm growing from it because I haven't done anything. But eventually I'm going to hit a point where I'm going to have to start boosting the weights up, which I've been noticing recently, and make it more challenging. So always go heavier weight with good form, okay? And you, you, know, you control it and you, you try to keep your mind-muscle connection with that muscle as much as possible, but you don't have to go overboard and, and squeeze it until you tear your muscle. That, you know, that, that's a little ex insane. Let's go to Banyanets, Ivan or Yvonne. If you lack overall back mass, would you do deadlifts at the beginning or at the end of a workout? I don't really feel back as good if I do deadlifts first, but if I do it in the end, I lose strength on it. Yeah. I, it's funny because um, I, I just had the same question in my head when I was used to train back, and I found that when I did deadlifts at the end of my back workout, I was just as strong as when I did them in the front of the uh, workout, so I used to do them at the end. But I, I would mix it around. Sometimes I would go first. You know what would happen invariably? I used to get bored with doing... I, I knew the, the basic at back ex exercises that worked best for me. And I would just get bored after a while. Sometimes doing the same. So I would do my workout backwards one day, you know. And I was like, wow, that was pretty good. And, and my weights didn't seem to suffer any. Because I never did excessive sets anyway. So I think that the order is not as important. Although, you know, I try to do the mass building exercises first. But every once in a while, I would say, you know what, I'm going to do one arm rows first. I'm going to do... I'm going to do a concentration curl, like and in my mind, I'm going to pre-exhaust. That was the big, the big term back in the 90s and early 2000s. And I would pre-exhaust, and then I would go to the heavier sets. And yeah, I would be a little, a little weaker, but I felt it just as much. Because remember, your body doesn't know how much weight it's lifting. It only knows what it perceives to be heavy. So if, if I'm doing you know, 40 pounds lighter on bent rows, but it feels just as heavy as you know, because I, I did some pre-exhaustion type stuff, then I'm still getting the same benefit out of it. So... I don't think it's as important as you know keeping the order. It's where you feel best. You know, remember deadlifts too. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to admit this. It's a lot of leg in there too. I always found that when I deadlifted consistently, my squat got better, and that that makes sense. You know, but my back also got thicker. The key is when you're deadlifting to try to use a little more back, you know, and not use so much leg. But invariably, if you don't want to hurt yourself, you you, you got to drive out of the bucket with your legs. You know. Let's go to S Fall 95. Dave, your opinion on quote carb blockers, uh, specifically white kidney bean extract. Yeah. To me, anything that blocks nutrient uptake is not something a bodybuilder really wants to take because you might be taking it to block carb, you know, intake, but what else is it blocking? You know, it could be blocking vitamins and stuff like that. We don't know. So I wouldn't take anything that blocks nutrient absorption. Same thing with the fat blockers. Yeah, these people take these fat blockers or these blockers that make you just, or these fat, uh, um, what is it called, um, that, a lie. It makes you just poop out the fat. But you're also pooping out all the essential fatty acids you're taking in too. So look, that's called eating disordered behavior. You might as well just stick your finger down your throat and throw it up the food, right? It's the same thing. You're throwing up the food, but you're throwing up the vitamins too. So. How about we just eat what we're supposed to and don't overeat? There's no shortcuts. There's no free meals. There's no way to get rid of calories, okay? Like I said, if you're really that worried about eating too much and you eat too much, stick your finger down your throat it because you're doing the same thing. It's the same. Or take a laxative and poop it out. That's just dysfunctional you know, type behavior. That's not conducive to building muscle and, and burning fat optimally. It's conducive to putting you in a, a mental hospital for you know, a, a food uh, eating disorder. Let's go to Big Daddy Jenks, big fan of the show. Your thoughts on, quote, clean bridging between cycles to maintain strength and prevent too much fat accumulation. You know, um, here's the problem with that. You know, a lot of guys are competing every year. They're doing a long off-season cycle, and then they're going into contest prep, and then they're going off. On contest prep, they're on clean. So when you go off, you really can't stay on clean. It's not doing anything at that point. So you got to get off that too. You're cleaning out everything. If you were just doing, you know, off season, off season, you know, cycle after you say we're doing like a 16 week cycle or 18 week cycle, and then you're going to take four to six weeks off and then you can go back and do another four. 
you might it might be fine to do it then i mean because you're not using it but if you plan on using it at the end of the year to do a competition i wouldn't bridge with clenbuterol then the less you use clenbuterol the more potent it works when you do take it so uh once again if you're in like the the idea of doing a competition once a year i wouldn't be taking clenbuterol at other times of the year good one here from josh r djj fitness how to overcome wide hips or make them less prominent i've always struggled with this and it takes away from my V taper, my quads and legs are naturally quite large. We, look, we all have our given structure you know, and structural abnormalities and structural gifts. And you know, it's funny thing is I always had a small, I have a small waist uh, and I have small hips, but I have big oblique muscles and, I, and I'm not that, my bone structure on top is not that wide. I, I was big because I, I had big shoulders, but I don't have wide bone structure. So for me, it, it looked like I didn't have as good a taper because even though I had a small waist, so it, once again, it's all an illusion. It's, and how you create that and, and, and craft that illusion to make yourself, in my mind, I just said, I'll just get as big as I can upper body because that'll make my waist look, you know, that'll give me a better taper. And it worked, you know, to a certain degree uh, for most of my career. It, it, I overcompensated, you know, structural deficits that I had by, by, by putting on all that size. So yeah, it, once again, the sport of bodybuilding is an illusion. Like Arnold said, it's like putting clay here, putting clay there, and, 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 doing what you, and working with what you got. And that's your bone structure genetics that cannot be altered. Proven zero optimal foods to eat for bulking and slowing down metabolism. I eat mostly beef, rice, and eggs. In the past, I was eating 1,000 grams of carbs. Either way, I can't gain weight. Yeah, usually the more fat you put in your diet, the better off you are because it's slow. As soon as fat hits the intestinal tract, so let's say you swallow some food, it's got protein, fat, and carbs in it. Okay, the more fat in it, as the food goes through your stomach, and because the stomach basically just breaks it down into like mush, they call it chyme. It starts protein digestion there, but you really don't get that much. Then it goes into the small intestine. When it hits that small intestine, okay, the gallbladder will release bile, okay, if there's fat in, in that mush, so to speak. And the bile will break up to the fat in smaller globulates. When that happens, it sends a signal to your brain to slow down, almost stop the intestinal tract from moving. Okay, the benefit of that for someone who is, you know, a, a, a fast metabolism person is that it enables you to absorb your food better because it's going through the intestinal tract slower. If you have no fat in there, okay, it, it'll go through a lot quicker because you're not going to get that release of bile and you're not going to get that effect of, of slowing down the food. So a lot of times people who don't eat fat in their diet, it's like they almost don't absorb their food properly because it goes through the intestinal tract too quickly. And so I always found that, especially people with fast metabolisms, in the off season, I have them eat an extraordinary amount of fat. Personally, I would eat eating over 50 grams of fat per meal, you know, at the peak of my career. And I, that was the only thing that slowed the food down enough for me to absorb the massive quantities that I was eating every day. Let's go to, love the name, Flex Luther. <laughs> Dave hates this show more than Mike Tyson hates seeing Mississippi. Is it true that consulting regular physicians with steroid related issues could flag you in the system and result in possible lack of insurance coverage later in life? No, because no, no, one, no one could turn you down for insurance. In other words, if you're a heroin addict and you overdose on heroin, you go to the hospital, they're not gonna say, well, get this guy out of here, he's a heroin addict. You know, they, they, they treat you for whatever's wrong with you. Just because you use something that, that may be not legal doesn't mean they can't treat you. Now, having said that, <laughs> If you go to your family physician that's on your health insurance policy and you have a, a massive infection and you tell them it was from taking a shot of steroids, they're going to document that in your file. Okay, so now there's documentation that you take anabolic steroids. So in that sense, yeah, that could be a problem, especially if you have a job that, that, that doesn't you know, allow you to use that. Okay, so in that sense, you might, I, don't, I don't know what you, should, what, what you can do. Maybe go to an urgent care or something like that. Nowadays, the urgent cares seem to be the way to go. Uh, you kind of could pay cash for that if you don't want to put it on your insurance. So, it, I mean, it, it's a sticky situation, you know, um, because I always had friends that were doctors, so they would write me, just write me a prescription and call it in, and, and, and I never even would go in. And luckily, I never had an abscess that needed to be opened up or anything like that. But it's a sticky situation because some people don't want it documented on their file. I didn't give a crap, personally, because I knew I was never going to work in the corporate, you know, uh, business world. I knew I wasn't going to be judged in that sense, and so I didn't care. I, I always knew I was going to have my own business, and, and, I, and I do, obviously. So, 
I mean, it, it's a personal decision, obviously. If you're worried and you have an infection and you're not going to the doctor because you're afraid it's going to be documented in your case, you're crazy because dying is not worth it. That's for sure. Let's go to Ali SS. Dave, I've been training for 12 years now, all natural, no drugs. I have an issue with my chest. I think I have gynecomastia. Any tips how to deal with it? Yeah, you know, I used to go to the summer camp uh, when I was younger, and there used to be this one kid on the bus, and I'm not going to say his name, but if he watched, he might be watching this. He's a, he became a bodybuilder, I know. Anyway, he had his chest, his, I mean, not pecs, his chest looked like a woman's breasts. I mean, literally. And they tortured right the- right here, Dave. <laughs> Tyler's funny. <laughs> Tyler's like, that was me. <laughs> um, and this kid would get tortured in camp. I mean, I felt, I almost felt bad for the kid. Of course, I was one of the torturers too, because that's what kids do, they're cruel. And, uh, you know, later we became, I was always friends with him, even though with the, all this, they tortured him. I didn't outright torture him, but I wasn't, you know, sticking up for him either. And some people just have gynecomastia and some people don't, just like some women have big breasts and some women have small breasts. And sometimes you don't even have to take anything to incite it, just the act of working out and naturally raising your, your body's endogenous testosterone level will do that. Smoking marijuana can also increase estrogen and cause, you know, breast development down there. So to me, the best way to, to prevent it and get rid of it is get the surgery and get it taken out. I, no joke, I've said this before, I've told the story a million times. Took one shot of Sustanon. The next day I had gyno. Not because I had, I probably had the tissue there anyway, it just wasn't big. And, and the estrogen flare up from the, from the Sustanon, which is very fast acting, just made these things just blow up into little marbles underneath my nipples. It was driving me nuts. Literally, it took me two weeks and, and I was at Dr. Blau's office. Someone had referred me to him. Um, I had known him from, he was a professor at the medical school I went to at the time. I went there, I said, I want these out. And, and luckily back then insurance covered it. You know, nowadays they don't, it doesn't cover it. But uh, I think it partially covered it. I paid for a little bit out of my pocket. But the bottom line is that's the, the best. Once I got them taken out, it was like, I was got a, I never had to worry about it again. No matter what I took, I never had any gyno, ever. You know, I might get a little water retentive, but I never had to deal with gynecomastia again. And if it's something that bothers you and you've had it like for your, you know, during your whole life, and it's, just get it taken out. It, people do it all the time. People who aren't even bodybuilders get it taken out. It's just a cosmetic procedure that, that's much more acceptable nowadays. Let's well, go to Travis Ray. Dave, how was it going from eating like a bodybuilder for so many years to eating like a normal person? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing. The food is a lot more enjoyable when I eat now because I'm actually hungry. <laughs> I used to have to eat so much food that not very rarely was there a meal that I actually enjoyed, unless I went out for sushi or something like that. I was always eating and always pounding food. That's why I used to eat McDonald's every day, because I physically couldn't stand eating clean food anymore. And, and you know what the truth was? I couldn't even grow anymore, because you can only eat so much clean food, and then there's just, it's just not enough calories. So I would go to a McDonald's meal. I would go to something. You know, I, would, I would have to increase the, 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 the messiness, or the, you know, if you want, of the food, the dirtiness of the food. I, I was eating too, too clean. And uh, nowadays, I, like I said, I eat when I'm hungry. I probably don't eat enough, but you know, I'm, I'm into this. Whenever I miss a meal or I, or I don't eat enough of them, I'm like, oh, it's, uh, you know, the, the research is out there. You know, fasting causes uh, increase of the sirtuins. Sirtuins help you live longer. And, you know, when you get to 50, you, you're looking to live longer. You're not worried about how big your arms are anymore. And so, you know, it doesn't bother me. Uh, like, once again, but when I do eat, I enjoy the food. Because uh, one thing I used to remember when I would diet, contest diet, and you guys out there who contest diet can, can attest to this, you could eat a plain piece of fish, and it's, it has the most exquisite taste you've ever tasted. You're like, holy mackerel, this is so good. I can't believe it. After the diet's over and you've had a couple of cheat meals, you try to eat that same piece of fish, you'll throw it up. You'll be like, I can't even believe that I was eating this. It, and it has no taste whatsoever. I have no desire to eat this whatsoever. Because your taste buds become much more fine-tuned when you're hungry and your body's in a starvation mode. Because let's face it, when you're losing body fat, you're putting your body into a starvation situation. And it's having to cannibalize you know, fat cells to, to, to have enough energy to sustain itself. So everything becomes keen, your sense of taste, because your body's trying to send signals, eat, eat, eat. It doesn't know that you're, you're purposely not eating. It thinks that you just not, you, know, you don't think you're hungry enough, so it keeps making you hungrier and hungrier, and it makes everything taste, all your, your taste buds is fine-tuned. Um, so I guess what you can say is everything tastes better to me nowadays. 
Let's go to Illmatic and why. Now, this is something you talked about on Heavy Muscle Radio last week uh, with Sean Roden and whether or not he trained uh, the way he switched trainers. So uh, he wants to know what happened to Psycho Fitness at Gold's Gym, if you have any update, and is he still training Roden and Stanimal? Chris Lewis reached out to me, because we, we text back and forth, after he, he saw that uh, little um, blurb I did, and he said, <laughs> he was laughing actually, and he said, uh, I said, what happened? He said, ah, I don't know what I'm talking about. But no, basically, um, he said he really hasn't talked to Sean in, in a bunch of months. He did admit that. You know, they went on this tour at the U- in the UK with Chris Aceto, Sean, and Psycho, and I don't think he, they've really talked that much. I think Sean Roden, to be honest with you, was out of the gym for a couple, was for many months since the Olympia. I don't think he trained for about three or four months seriously. And I know that he's just starting to get back into it again. According to what um, I was told, that from Sean Roden, actually, he said that um, that one little set he did with Charles Glass at the gym was kind of a joke. I don't know if he's training with him at all now. From what I hear, that's not the case yet, but I don't think Sean has really started training seriously. But once he gets into Olympia prep time period, that's usually when he goes to Cycle Lewis, because Cycle Lewis has a way of, of motivating Sean. Whether Sean switches to Charles or not, who knows? You know, I think what the problem is with a lot of these pros is they need someone who's going to really motivate them. And sometimes, and, and let's face it, both guys are great trainers. So it depends on what mindset Sean is in and what he thinks is going to help and benefit him best. I don't know what's going on with Psycho Lewis, if he's kicked out of goals or not. Psycho said he, that that's not true, um, but who knows? There's a lot, you know what, there's a lot of politics there because there's a lot of trainers in Gold's Venice and everyone is, you know, trying to cut each other's throat there for business. And, you know, people get arguments and they go leave, they come back, they leave, they come back. That's just the, that's just the, uh, the drama that goes on there on a regular basis. Speaking of trainers and coaches, Ivan Bodybuilding wants to know, why do top bodybuilders have coaches? Some of them are really knowledgeable and they still hire coaches uh, and they pay so many mo- so much money for it. He brings up uh, Arash or Bart. Now, many of these top pros are coached themselves like Arash. So I guess he wants to know, well, if they're already that, why would they then hire a coach themselves? Because they're all psychopaths. That's why. You can't, you can't advise yourself when you're in that mode. You, you, you're so wanting to be the best that you can be that you make all the wrong decisions. You do things in excess and you screw things up. So it's better when you have a guy that's emotionally detached from you that can make decisions for you, okay? I mean, you know when someone's doing something crazy and when someone's doing something right. And if I trust the person, if I have someone who says, hey Dave, I trust you impeccably. I know you're gonna bring me in the best. I'd rather have you be my second eye than me try to advise myself and, and make stupid mistakes. And believe me, Top pros make stupid mistakes all the time because they want to win so bad that they'll start doing extreme things because some idiot at the gym mentioned it to them and it sounded like a good idea. But if they have someone coaching them, let's say I'm their coach, they say, hey, Dave, this guy at the gym said I should do this. This is the new way to, to do this. And, and I tell him he's, he's out of his freaking mind. He's going to be like, all right, that's what I thought. Or if I say, hey, yeah, that is a good way to do it. You know, I just started doing this with another guy. Why don't we try it on you? Now he feels much more comfortable doing that. So it's always good to have a second set of eyes on you, even if you're a coach yourself, because it's very, very hard to advise yourself. Let's go to Jay Rosoto. I know you answered this question, but this was a long, long time ago. Why does every species product end with lies? Well, L-Y-Z-E is a, is a chemical reaction. Pro- it's like, a, you know, just like uh, it means that there's some kind of... Uh, metabolic processes going on. So I liked it. When I was trying to come up with my first product, which was a fat burner, I found, I, I actually was, <laughs> I was actually selling another person's product called lipogenesis, which is a stupid name for a fat burner because it actually means, well, genesis means the production of, and lipo is fat, so it actually means the production of fat, which is stupid for the name, of, even though it sounds cool. So I said, well, you know what? I'll come up with, with a product that means the, the breakdown of fat. So lipo lies, you know, the breakdown of fat. And I just, you know, and then I said, well, I'm going to make, I wanted to make a sister product to it that was a, was a nighttime uh, fat burner and sleep aid. So I called it Somalize because Somas kind of Im- implies sleep. And I figured the initiation of sleep and, and fat loss, and, and that's how that happened. And then, then I, when I decided to come out with my protein, I didn't know what to call it. And I always wanted, you know, because it's a, it's a way isolate, I wanted to use the word ISO in it. So I said, well, maybe I might as well just call it Isolize. And then once I got to that point, I said, well, I might as well keep consistent with the names because... It's always nice to have a naming nomenclature because if anyone hears the word L-Y-Z-E, they know it's Dave Palumbo Species Nutrition. 
Um, I was going to make amino evolved, our, our branch chain essential amino acid product, I was going to make that aminolyzed, but there was another product that was called amino light, and I felt it was too close, and there could be confusion, and I didn't want to get into any problems with that, so I, I changed it, and I, I made it amino evolved. But really, I did it so that people would have product recognition, brand recognition. Let's go to uh, Seed LMR. Every bodybuilder eats the same proteins, chicken, red meat, turkey, salmon, and white fish. Is there anything wrong with eating shrimp? It's my favorite food. I have a lot of people who ask me that. Shrimp, scallops, I'm like, yeah, knock yourself out. I don't care, protein's protein. Um, I wouldn't eat it every single meal, but it's fine. I, you know, I don't eat a lot of uh, shellfish only for the sheer fact that you know, shellfish are, are, are scavengers. They eat you know, the, the crap that falls to the bottom of the sea. So I don't know, you know if they have it, you know, I just did a video recently, it's going to go up a rant about, about everything that's good for you is, is actually bad for you too. So I, who knows, you know, if you overeat shellfish, if you can accumulate some of the waste, you know, toxins into your body that they're consuming. So I try to, I eat shellfish, but I, I eat it in very small amounts. And um, it's funny because, it, it, you know, kosher people, true kosher people don't eat shellfish. It's, it's against, uh, supposedly in the Bible, you can't eat shellfish or scavenger creatures. Um, they probably had that in place back then because they probably, it was more of, like I said, a health thing. Because if people got sick back then, they had no antibiotics to cure them. So, you know, once again, I don't think there's anything wrong with eating those type of fish. Just don't eat them in excess. That's all. Take a couple of more questions. Sam Bryan, 84. How much sleep do you actually need for optimal muscle growth? And is it different for naturals versus enhanced lifters? And I'll throw in, during your bodybuilding days, how much and how often would you sleep? Yeah. I don't think you can sleep, and I don't think there's anything that would be too much sleep. I think that, you know, obviously 12 hours is a long time to sleep every day. And if you're sleeping 12 hours, you're probably missing meals, so that's not productive. I would sleep eight to nine hours a night if I, you know, assuming I had the, you know, the time, and usually I did, unless I was traveling or something like that. And then I would try to take a nap. This was when I was in the brunt of my, you know, mass building. So I was sleeping almost, you know, nine, 10 hours a night. And I felt that that was optimal for me to recover and to really feel good. And luckily I had the, the leisure to do that. I wasn't working a real job at, at a certain point. I was bodybuilding for a living. I was guest posing. I was working for metrics. I was, uh, you know, training a couple people here and there. I was doing some diets for people. And so I had enough money to get by and, and, and pay for all my food bills and all my, you know, I was living at home with my dad for a while until I, until I paid off my student loans. And it worked. And I think that when I would take that nap in the afternoon after I would train, I would, I would wake up and I feel like I actually recovered from the workout. Now, I always found that I was a very slow recoverer. In other words, I needed a lot of rest. Uh, my body didn't just naturally recover. I know guys that sleep four to six hours a night and they, and they recover fine, but that wasn't my body. Um, I always say, look at a baby. What does a baby do? You know, I have kids now. Baby drinks a bottle, goes, back, goes to sleep. It wakes up, it goes, drinks another bottle, goes back to sleep, okay? It sleeps and eats and sleeps and eats every two hours. I mean, that's really what bodybuilders should do if we, if we were able to, right? So if we're eating every two hours, we should try to sleep as much as possible too because when you're sleeping, your body's recovering. And not only is the muscles recovering, but the brain is recovering, the neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters that your brain produces, okay, actually tell the mu allow the muscles and the nervous system to communicate. If the nerves can't tell the muscles to fire, you're not growing, okay? That's all there is to it. So you want your nervous system to recover. Anyone who's ever done a really hard uh, squat workout out there will know after that workout, you don't want to eat, you feel kind of queasy. I would always just guzzle a shakedown. I, I, I just felt horrible. And that's because you're traumatizing your nervous system from, from, think about it. You put 600 pounds on your back and you're squatting and you're leg pressing and you're doing all kinds of intense weight that's using your whole body. That's traumatic to your body and to your nervous system. And you need sleep and rest to recover from that. Last question of the show, Rob MT. Uh, Dave, top three, all right, so you're on a desert island, a desert island that has nothing but a fully equipped gym and an abundance of snakes, he puts, obviously. <laughs> you can only take three dietary supplements with you to this desert island. Which three dietary supplements would you bring? Okay. I wouldn't bring vitamin D3. Because if I'm on a desert island, I can lay out in the sun and produce my own. Okay, so that, that's one thing. Because normally that would be a supplement you'd want to take, but not on a desert island. Don't need that. Okay? Um, 
you're probably going to have coconuts on this desert island, I would think. So, but that's not, those fats in the coconuts are not essential. So I know my brain needs, my brain definitely needs uh, essential fats. So I'm going to bring omega lies with me, okay, which is going to be all my essential fats, okay? Now, I don't, I could, I'm assuming I'll be able to catch fish in the ocean, okay, so that'll be my protein, okay, so I would also, but my minerals and my vitamins might not be, you know, adequately supplied there, because on a desert island, you might not be able to grow, you know, how are you going to grow vegetables and fruit and stuff like that? They might just, like I said, only be coconuts, so I would take my V mineralize with me, vitamins and minerals. So I got vitamins, minerals, and I got my um, essential fats, that's my two supplements. Now my third supplement is, is going to be the one that, that I would call my luxury item supplement. What do I really want, you know, in another supplement? And I probably would get, I would probably bring a protein drink with me. I'll tell you why, because at least I'd have some, another option of, instead of just fish to eat, you know, for my protein source. And that would really be it. I can get my, you know, I'm sure I'm going to be able to, like I said, eat plenty of coconuts. Uh, and the flesh of the coconut has obviously got some, some carbs in it, not a lot. It's got a lot of fat in it. Uh, there's really no protein in coconuts, but that's the way it goes. And, and maybe there might be some bananas on this desert island, which will be carbs. So we really want to focus on vitamins, minerals, essential fats, and then, of course, protein. But once again, the protein is kind of a luxury item because you do have fish. How's that? That's going to do for this episode <laughs> of Ask Dave. What, what did he say? I said, how's that? That's not too bad on, on a spontaneous whim, right? Oh, uh, I think Tyler says something in the background. Uh, no. <laughs> Tyler would have taken ring dings. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Tyler, what would you take on a What would you take, Tyler? Chicken fingers, tacos. Um, Chicken fingers, tacos, and. A bunch of Yoohoo chocolate And Yoohoo chocolate milk. There you go. There's his protein. <laughs> Tyler wouldn't have to fish. I'd be out there with a freaking stick and a, and, a, and a hook, a shell hook to try to catch a fish, and Tyler would be drinking Yoohoo's. <laughs> so. On that note, that's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave again, brought to you by Ariel Cut, Speechy Nutrition, and Liquid Sunrays. For Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.